This is a mechanism of disease map for Parkinson's disease. I'll be talking about the etiologies, the pathophysiology, and the manifestations of Parkinson's disease. I'll also be discussing these other causes of Parkinsonism. So, as in all of these flowcharts, the core concepts are color coded according to these um, concepts in the legend up here. And this is the last time we'll have everything up on the slide. So if you want to take a screenshot, go ahead. I'll be clearing it and talking about everything one by one. We'll flash up the pathophysiology, but we really want to talk about the etiologies first. There are a few different types of etiologies for Parkinson's disease. First, we'll talk about the genetic and hereditary causes. The most common of these hereditary causes is a mutation in glucocerebrosidase. This is the GBA gene, and this results in altered autophagy and lysosomal function, which results in impaired alpha-synuclein clearance. One of the key findings in Parkinson's disease on a molecular level is an increase in the protein alpha-synuclein. So it makes sense that if you impair alpha-synuclein clearance, this might predispose you to Parkinson's disease. Other mutations include mutations in the alpha-synuclein gene itself. That's the SCNA gene, and this leads to an increased number of Lewy bodies, another key finding in Parkinson's disease. So you can have duplication of the alpha-synuclein gene or even triplication of the alpha-synuclein gene, and those will predispose you to Parkinson's disease. More mutations, uh, Dardarin gene mutation, that's the LRRK2, and this is an autosomal dominant gene mutation. This leads to altered phosphorylation of target proteins and lysosomal dysfunction. So I suspect this might also result in impaired alpha-synuclein clearance. Lastly, for the genetic factors, Parkin mutation. That's a mutation in the gene PARK2, and this one is recessive. This results in impaired turnover and clearance of mitochondria, also predisposing you to Parkinson's disease. Now you'll notice it's hard to tie many of these etiologies to the specific items within the pathophysiology of Parkinson's disease, and that kind of highlights a gap in our knowledge. So we do know a lot about these genetics and hereditary causes, but it turns out that a lot of Parkinson's that we diagnose is idiopathic, and we don't know what causes it. So um, that's unfortunate, and again, highlights a gap in our knowledge about the origins of this disease. So next, there are many other diseases that can cause secondary Parkinsonism. First, there are a few infectious or microbial causes. Viral infections can cause Parkinson's disease. That's HSV, herpes, and HIV, um, like HIV AIDS, human um, immunodeficiency virus, can cause Parkinson's disease. There are some bacterial causes, like treponema pallidum, um, that's syphilis, and uh, mycobacterium tuberculosis, that's TB. Some parasitic causes, like Toxoplasmosis gondii, as well as the Plasmodium species. This is the parasite that's responsible for malaria. And prion diseases can also cause Parkinsonism symptoms. So creutzfeldt jakob disease, caused by prions, can present as secondary Parkinsonism. There are a few metabolic diseases as well. These also have a genetic origin and kind of a molecular biology, biochemical pathophysiology involved in them. Wilson's disease, which is a problem of copper transport, hemochromatosis, which is a problem of iron overload, you're not able to dump your iron, and neiman pick uh, I believe it's a glycogen storage disease, those can all present with Parkinson-like symptoms. The next three are pharmacologic or toxic etiologies. There are a few medications, and they're mostly anti-dopaminergic. So this includes haloperidol, as well as some of the other classic first-generation antipsychotics. Metoclopramide is usually used to regulate your GI tract. That has some anti-dopaminergic effects and can lead to Parkinsonism. Amiodarone, valproate, and lithium as well can cause Parkinsonism symptoms. There's an illicit drug called MPTP, and that breaks down into a metabolite called MPP+, and that can cause Parkinsonism. Lastly, these are just some miscellaneous toxins that you might have in the workplace or otherwise be exposed to. Carbon monoxide, carbon disulfide, and manganese can all cause Parkinsonism. There are other neurodegenerative disorders that can lead to Parkinson-like symptoms. For instance, in advanced Huntington's disease, you can have Parkinson's symptoms as well. And lastly, there's the vascular risk factors. If you have um, any kind of heart problems or stroke problems, or if you've had a couple TIAs in the past, that can predispose you to having 
Parkinsonism as well. So cardio and cerebrovascular risk factors, including obesity, metabolic syndrome, maybe a family history, smoking, cocaine, those can all cause subcortical arteriosclerotic encephalopathy, which can predispose you to this pathophysiology as well. So now that we've talked about the etiologies, let's get into the pathophysiology. There are a few that are scattered here, and I'll be able to tie some of these to the manifestations, but not all of them. So first, in Parkinson's disease, you have dopaminergic neuron degeneration in substantia nigra. So substantia nigra is the part of the brain that it occurs in. The dopaminergic neurons are the ones that are affected, and you typically really start to show symptoms when over 50% of your dopaminergic neurons in the substantia nigra have degenerated. This results in dopamine deficiency at the striatum, and that results in interrupted transmission to the thalamus and the motor cortex. In addition, in another part of the brain, in the nucleus basalis of Maynard, you might have acetylcholine excess. You'll have a depletion of other neurotransmitters, serotonin and norepinephrine, in the RAFE nuclei, <clears throat> and you'll have these Lewy body deposits throughout the autonomic nervous system as well. So kind of scattered knowledge of pathophysiology for Parkinson's disease, but united, they all kind of present um, as this series of symptoms that are recognizable as the disease. First, some early symptoms in a patient presenting with Parkinson's disease. Um, it's important to note that all of these manifestations are very progressive. They present over years, not over months. So it might be something that a patient has for 5, 10, 15 years, um, and oftentimes they might not be diagnosed on initial presentation. So these are how the Parkinson's symptoms might present at their earliest. So constipation is an early symptom. Patients often have sleep problems in the beginning, like REM sleep disorder, daytime sleepiness, or restless leg syndrome. They might start to lose their sense of smell. This is also called anosmia um, when it's completely gone. And they might have a new onset of a mood disorder, like depression, anxiety, or just apathy, loss of interest in things that previously made them happy. The most recognizable symptoms of Parkinson's are the motor symptoms. So we'll be talking about these here. Um, there's this nice acronym, TRAP, and you can think of Parkinson's disease as trapping the patient. So the T for TRAP stands for tremor. This is usually a resting tremor. It's somewhere between four and six hertz in frequency. Um, it's also been described as a pill rolling tremor. It almost looks like the patient is rolling a pill between their forefinger and their thumb. Um, and this pill rolling resting tremor tends to get worse with stress and tends to be a little bit better with voluntary movements. The R in the trap mnemonic stands for rigidity. Patients will have a high and persistent resistance to passive joint movement. And when you have a tremor, as we discussed, the pill rolling tremor, plus tonus, this results in a cogwheel rigidity. So you can imagine trying to bend your patient's arm open and it kind of, um, it kind of cranks open like a cogwheel. It, it opens kind of in spurts. That's the kind of rigidity that patients with Parkinson's disease have. Next, the A is akin, akinis, akinesia, excuse me. And this is a no, this is low movement. It's like either no movement or very little movement. Patients with Parkinson's disease tend to freeze. They tend to um, move less than people who don't have Parkinson's disease. This is especially evident in their walking, in their gait. Uh, people with Parkinson's disease tend to have a low arm swing when they're walking, um, whereas if you or I walk without Parkinson's disease, we might swing our arms um, just kind of naturally in our normal gait. In addition, while we're speaking about the gait, they have short steps, and it's often a shuffling gait. This is most evident when you ask the patient to turn around. So normally when somebody turns around, uh, like a 180 degree turn to come back in the direction they just walked, they might take one or two steps. But somebody with Parkinson's disease can take five to eight steps to, tur to turn around. And this entire movement, short steps with a shuffling gait, um, low arm swing, it's overall called a Parkinsonian gait. So that might be worth knowing as well. The P in the trap mnemonic stands for postural instability. In general, people with Parkinson's disease will have imbalance and they won't have a good writing reflex. So if you push them over, they're not quite able to adjust their posture and they're not quite able to um, catch themselves. So they, they have a tendency to fall as a result. On physical exam, you might do a pull test and the pull test is typically positive in people with Parkinson's disease. This is when you go up to them from behind, grab their shoulder and push or pull them in one direction and they tend to lose their balance and fall in that case. So that's postural instability for Parkinson's disease. 
Some other motor symptoms that are worth knowing, patients with Parkinson's disease have dystonia, and this is essentially sustained muscle contraction that leads to an involuntarily fixed posture. So for instance, if you were to take a patient's arm who has Parkinson's disease and put it over their head, um, that arm would kind of, and kind of drop their arm and tell them to just relax their arm. That arm will be involuntarily fixed above their head for some time. They have a sustained muscle contraction that keeps the, the arm above their head more than a person without Parkinson's disease. They'll also have increased flexion of the muscles in their axial skeleton. This can lead to a stooped posture. Their handwriting tends to shrink as the disease progresses. This is called micrographia. And they'll have decreased facial expressions. This is called hypomimia. So those are all the motor disorders of Parkinson's disease. And those all result from low dopamine state um, in the substantia nigra, at the striatum, and then interrupted transmission in the thalamus and motor co uh, cortex. From the low serotonin and low norepinephrine, they will have neuropsychiatric symptoms. So these include depression, they can have decreased attention, low concentration or inability to concentrate like they used to. They can start to have memory problems and they can have decreased executive function as well. From the broad Lewy body deposits throughout the autonomic nervous system, they'll have these autonomic symptoms listed here. This includes urinary urgency that can lead to urinary incontinence. They can have orthostatic hypotension, which is kind of a decreased uh, blood pressure when they stand up. Their body is no longer able to um, increase the tone in their vessels to keep their blood pressure when they stand up, so they have low blood pressure upon standing. Oily skin and impaired sex function are other autonomic symptoms in people with Parkinson's disease. The acetylcholine excess causes dyskinesia. This is just general jerking, twitching, and tics. So kind of like the motor symptoms, but more jerky and quick. Um, that's from too much acetylcholine in the nucleus basalis of Maynert. And lastly, there are some miscellaneous symptoms that you might find in Parkinsonism. This includes apathy, an impulsive or irritable behavior. That's relatively new onset for somebody who's 65, 75 years old. They can have fatigue, they can have poor sleep, and they can have progression of their decreased sense of smell. So worsening anosmia. So this is all we had for the Parkinson disease flowchart for the mechanism of disease. I hope this was helpful. Thank you for listening.